The future of Hungary's main left-wing opposition newspaper is in doubt. About 2,000 Hungarians have protested outside Parliament in Budapest, saying press freedom is under threat. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. Dueling narratives in Hungary over why a major newspaper there has gone out of print. There are now 26 Palestinian journalists in Israeli jails. None have been charged, none put on trial. How do we even know what is true? Take back control of huge sums of money. If we really are living in a post-fact world. And Chinatown, not the Academy Award-winning film, the Fox News version. Am I supposed to bow to say hello? Hardly the critic's choice. This past week, when one of Hungary's biggest opposition newspapers, Neb Sabudshag, closed down, the details of its own story were murky. The reasons cited by the newspaper's owners were economic. However, journalists there said the move was political. The owners said that the paper had been suspended, that it isn't dead. Again, not everyone believes them. Neb Sabudshag, which means people's freedom, was influential and had often been critical of Prime Minister Viktor Orban's right-wing populist government. In the week prior to its demise, it published exposés on corruption within Orban's political circles. It also criticized the government over a referendum held earlier this month on the issue of Hungary, refugees and the European Union. Since coming to power for the second time in 2010, Viktor Orban has reined in state-owned news outlets, changed the way the rest of the media are regulated, and the closure, even if it does prove temporary, of Neb Sabudshag is being seen as part of a wider attempt to wield influence over private media as well. The government denies any involvement in this story, putting it this way. The true violation of freedom of the press would be if the government interfered with the decision of the media owner. However, there is a regional trend at play here in some former Soviet bloc countries involving politicians, well-connected businessmen and the media groups that they control. And it's a trend that is affecting how public opinion is shaped. Our starting point this week is the Hungarian capital, Budapest. <laughs> Friday, October 7th, moving day at Neb Sabudshag, or so it seemed. Journalists and support staff had been told that the newsroom was moving to a new building. They were each given a box to pack their things. Newspapers are often the dispensers of bad news, and Neb Sabudshag had some, but kept it, not only from its readers, from its own employees. Saturday morning, I got a message uh, from one of our investigating journalists that he tried to access his company mailbox, but it had a message that he is unauthorized. So his first uh, idea was that he is fired. A few minutes later, there was a company letter telling that Nip Sobocek is being shut down but nobody come and look us in the eyes and say that your work is not needed anymore. We were in total shock. What you have to know about this, this was the largest selling uh, opposition or largest selling political newspaper in Hungary. The owner said that it was a business decision, economic decision, which uh, cannot be true. Uh, you just do not close a newspaper like, like this in, in, in a moment. Um, so. If you do it, then, then you have other reasons, not economical reasons. The government in denial is very strategic. I mean, uh, saying that there is no uh, interference in the press is almost uh, funny. The interference uh, into the press has happened uh, since 2010, when Viktor Orban, the prime minister, came back to power. Neb Sabudshag got its start 60 years ago, during the Hungarian uprising against Soviet control as the official paper of the Communist Party, and then transformed into the voice of the political left. Over the past few weeks, it broke two major stories alleging government corruption, one about a cabinet minister's penchant for expensive travel, the other on the governor of the central bank and an alleged conflict of interest. Hungary is politically polarized, but even journalists on the other side of the ideological fence, like Andras Stumpf, say they're sorry to see the paper go. They were really doing good journalism. 
they were always lefties. They, they were always on the side of the socialists, but uh, it was quite obvious, so they, they also told, told you. But there was quality journalism too. How damaging it was, I don't think it was doing much damage to the, uh, to, to the government. So this could partly be attributed to a general apathy among uh, the people, but this could also be attributed to the fact that access to information of this kind in the countryside is quite difficult. In the countryside, uh, people do not really have a choice. All they can listen to is the public service radio, maybe a Catholic radio station, or perhaps a commercial radio station that is uh, just redistributing the news bulletins that have been compiled by the National News Agency, which is under government control. The Orban government came to power in 2010 and quickly began to reshape the Hungarian media landscape. Within a year, demonstrators were on the streets of Budapest, protesting over the government's new media regulator, which was given wider powers and was stalked with the government's hand-picked appointees. That and the changes the government made at the state-owned broadcaster Madiar TV drew the concern of the European Union over a lack of plurality in the Hungarian media. However, the EU admits that its influence over media policy in its member states is limited. That has been apparent in Hungary and other post-communist countries, such as Poland, where the Law and Justice Party government led by Jaroslav Kaczynski plans to emulate Hungary's approach to the media, which has included overseeing the sale of media outlets to new owners more aligned with their government's policies. In Poland, since the uh, Law and Justice Party got into power, the government has done quite the same thing as in Hungary, like putting in place in July a National Council, uh, firing some uh, public employees from the TV or, or from the radio, or trying to implement new laws that are violating the freedom of press. And um, in general, in the, the media landscape has changed a lot because also holy girls have been able to acquire a lot of uh, private media in the past few years. One of the general regional trends in recent years has been the withdrawal of foreign capital from the region generated by the economic crisis back in 2008. So some of the biggest investors have uh, indeed left Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic as well, which is an issue because foreign ownership was seen as a guarantee of editorial independence because foreign owners were largely autonomous and their places have been uh, taken by domestic media oligarchs who have uh, very close relationships to the political parties and political actors. We always had this strange feeling or, or this fear it will happen to us and I'm pretty sure a lot of colleagues in Poland, in the Czech Republic, in Romania are feeling the same. They are not using the law anymore as a weapon against us, they are using ownership as a weapon. Media owners do wield power, the kind that most parliamentarians, including those who protested the closing of Neb Subudshag this past week, will never have. Meanwhile, those boxes that were packed up that day, under false pretenses, they've been delivered to another office in Budapest, a makeshift newsroom. The out-of-work reporters insist that there are still Hungarians out there willing to buy their kind of journalism. But is there anyone in Viktor Orbán's Hungary willing and able to own it? Hungary's media landscape, both private and public, has been altered by the government over the past five years, but there are some alternative news outlets out there offering up different kinds of coverage. Here are some of them. Andrush Petu was working for a paper called Origo when he did a story on a cabinet minister's lavish expenses. As a result, his editor was fired. So Petu quit, and he, his former boss, and another colleague launched Direct 36. Direct for the style of reporting. 36 is Hungary's international calling code. The site has exposed several prominent politicians for failing to reveal how rich they are to voters. 
Atlatso is Hungarian for transparent. The site is crowdfunded, investigative, and features a bribe tracker that allows readers to report corruption anonymously. Finally, when Viktor Orban created a new media regulator, Klub Radio, a persistent critic of the government, became one of its victims. It lost its broadcasting license in 2011, but came back after winning a tough two-year court battle with the regulator and remains on the air. Other media stories that are on our radar this week. WikiLeaks has made public a trove of more than 2,000 emails that shed light on the inner workings of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign and its relationship with the American media. The latest batch was released this past Monday, allegedly obtained from the account of Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta. In one of them, Haim Saban, the owner of the Spanish-language network Univision, receives an email from the Clinton campaign praising the moderators at a Democratic debate in March that was hosted by the network. The moderators were excellent, it said. It made Hillary appear direct and strong. Thanks for Univision. Another email from last year details plans for an off-the-record meeting with New York Times reporter Mark Leibovich, who, the note says, is writing a sympathetic piece on Clinton. In another email, Leibovich seems to give Clinton veto power over the quotes he can use in his article. The New York Times says that it stands by that story and that it was transparent with its readers. Brian Fallon, a spokesperson for the Clinton campaign, accused WikiLeaks of being a propaganda arm of the Russian government, running interference for their pet candidate, Donald Trump. There are now more than two dozen Palestinian journalists in Israeli jails having yet to be charged in a state of legal limbo that Israel calls administrative detention. Late last month, another five were locked up when Israeli security forces raided Sanibel Radio in Hebron, suspending it from broadcasting for three months and welding the doors shut just to make sure. The five, Hamad al-Namura, Ahmad Darwish, Muntasar Nasser, Nidal Omar and Mohammed Omran, have all been accused of incitement and promotion of terrorism. They join another 21 Palestinian reporters behind bars under administrative detention, none of whom have been charged or put on trial. According to Akil Awawadi, who says he left the radio station six months ago, fearing imprisonment, all of them are journalists. Israel makes it out that they are reporting in a way that encourages others to throw stones, and that is just not the case. For Serbian political cartoonist Dusan Petricic, it was a confusing week. First, he was fired, for which he reportedly had the prime minister to blame. Then he was rehired, for which he apparently had the same prime minister to thank. Petricic's work appears in Politica, one of the country's largest daily newspapers. He says the paper asked him to tone down his drawings of Serbian Prime Minister Aleksandar Vucic, and when he refused, the newspaper fired him September 30th. The paper responded by saying that Petricic repeatedly missed his deadlines and was too expensive to employ. The firing made news, and that prompted the government to issue a statement advising Politica to continue working with the cartoonist who was subsequently offered his job back. The Paris-based Media Watch Group, Reporters Without Borders, said the Serbian Prime Minister's meddling in a daily newspaper's internal affairs is extremely disturbing and that it was indicative of an outrageous level of collusion between the government and some of the media in Serbia. The term, speaking truth to power, goes back to the 1950s and the struggle for civil rights and racial equality in the United States. It has since been adopted by journalists and is now considered to be part of the job. But what about when power doesn't speak the truth? In the U.S. these days, there are signs that the mainstream news media have belatedly begun to push back against Donald Trump, who repeatedly, routinely tramples on the facts, the debate this past week being the latest example of that. There are dozens of fact-checking outfits whose specific task is to dissect claims made by politicians and public figures, drill deep into their past statements, statistics and raw data, and test all of that against reality. But how much of an impact does that kind of work have? Does it really make a difference? Are people not happier these days, as one writer puts it, to live in worlds built out of our own facts. The Listening Post's Will Young now on whether we live in a post-fact world or whether rumors of the demise of the truth have been exaggerated. <laughs>
Fact checking has always been an essential part of journalism. What you have these days is more noise, and it's useful to audiences if you flag up where you're doing your fact checking. And it would also allow us to regain control over the 350 million subscription we pay to customers every week. If you just want access to the fact, you want to cut straight through the noise, through the claims. Um, come here and you'll, you'll find it. Our goals are twofold. One, to hold politicians accountable uh, for what they're saying and also to be there for voters. And we really see that as our role, to help voters see through the spin, separate fact from fiction. If you add up all of Trump's ideas, the result would be a loss of 3.4 million jobs. Journalists are supposed to be the people standing and saying, actually, no, what you're being told is untrue, what you're being told is not the whole story, here's why. If we understand that a piece of news is held up to certain norms of reporting and fact-checking, we are more likely to trust it. If we see this process transparently, then it builds trust. That's why we believe, I think, that fact-checking is now necessary and it should come from somebody independent of the original media outlet. Argentina's first and foremost fact-checking outlet is Chequiado. Their goal, they say, is to protect the public discourse by increasing the cost of lying. While their home is online, Chequiado also has columns in major newspapers and slots on radio and TV. And when Chequiado live fact-checked Argentina's presidential debate, not only readers, but politicians too, took note. Of the five presidential candidates who took part in the debate, four of them got in touch afterwards asking for clarifications. So it's not like what we publish goes unheard. Chequiado disproved a claim made by the president. That wasn't true, and when the vice president was interviewed on the radio, she admitted they'd made a mistake that Chequiado had made them realize it and that they wouldn't do it again. Actually, they did do it again, but at least they acknowledged that someone is out there who's paying attention. So what if a politician is caught in a lie and yet goes on to repeat that lie and a host of others? Take Donald Trump. The Washington Post's fact-checker gives four Pinocchio ratings only to politicians' biggest whoppers. It's given four Pinocchios to nearly two-thirds of Donald Trump's statements. When the Tampa Bay Times PolitiFact team announced their 2015 Lie of the Year award, it couldn't pick just one, but gave it to all the misstatements of the Trump campaign. Case in point, did Trump oppose or support going to war in Iraq? And then I said, total catastrophe. Donald Trump has said several times that he was opposed to the Iraq war. So this is something that we've fact-checked. We went through several different news databases. We were unable to find uh, any piece of evidence that he opposed the war before it started. He has continued to say it, so we certainly have not succeeded in, in changing the claim. But uh, our work and the work of others pointing this out, uh, I, I think, has become now ingrained in uh, the journalism community. The journalism community may appreciate a good fact check, but what about audiences at large? In the UK, the campaign to take Britain out of the European Union was riddled with misleading claims, lots of them coming from former journalist and leading voice for Leave, Boris Johnson. Many of Johnson's more outlandish Euro claims were easy enough to dispel. But what about the more elusive truth about the cost of EU membership? Take back control of huge sums of money, 350 million pounds a week, and spend... A figure that was questioned by numerous experts. But perhaps, as Vote Leaves' Michael Gove said... I think the people in this country have had enough of experts the £350 million figure kept coming up throughout the campaign and our first response was to, to look at, right, where did they get it from? Whichever way it was expressed, we would find a way to take it to pieces and get to the actual figure. As the campaign went on, I suppose we were slightly surprised that the campaign kept using it. So, from a reality check point of view, we 
basically kept repeating what we've done. There's only so many times we can write the same story over and over again. And then claims get repeated and re repeated and repeated on Twitter or Facebook or different news sites on the internet. A limit or a challenge, I guess, for fact-checking this social media echo chamber. The ability with the internet and social media to really live in um, a bubble and to seek out uh, information that only conforms with your viewpoint. Fact-checkers say they are not police for the politicians, that they can't stop our leaders from lying. All they can do is keep the electorate informed. But if 52% of British voters voted out of the European Union, and if Donald Trump has convinced enough Americans that he can make America great again, are we not living in a post-fact world? Once something has become true in people's minds, then there is very little that an independent fact-checker can do to correct it. Campaigns like the Trump campaign or the Brexit campaign and many others across the world share a certain anti-establishment approach. There is no place in this for somebody who has studied the issue to come and say, look, as it happens, Trump is lying to you about immigration, or Brexit will be a disaster for the economy. This establishment includes experts, it includes the media. What campaigns like this do is that they go out and they tell people, don't believe anything that you're told, so there's no place in this for fact. I don't believe that journalism is going to stop bad information, nor is it the case that we live in a world where people no longer care whether what politicians say is true or not. A journalist isn't a prosecutor, isn't a judge, and is not qualified to judge or to decide how people should vote. People make up their own minds as to who they wish to vote for, and sometimes that has nothing to do with good sense. And that is a fact. On the download now, our viewers on who we can believe in a post-fact world. Every piece of information carries an emotional and a logical side, and today the emotional side is becoming predominant. Uh, news are faster and faster, and polarization helps uh, to grasp concepts quicker, drives the conversation, and at the same time media are caught in this spiral, because this conversation that goes on gets more traction and then for more revenue from the advertisers. And finally, how many stereotypes applying to Asian Americans can you fit into one five-minute news package? Fox News's Jesse Waters gave it his best shot for a segment on the O'Reilly factor last week on the back of a presidential debate in which Donald Trump went on and on about China. So Fox hit the road and went from their New York City headquarters all the way to Chinatown. That's a whole four miles, ostensibly, to ask people about their preferred presidential candidates. However, what followed was a masterclass in how to make insensitive, or one could reasonably argue, racist television. As you're about to see, it's not the only time Jesse Waters has antagonized and ridiculed total strangers in public. For Bill O'Reilly's intrepid man on the street, that seems to be part of the job description. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. I like these watches. Are they hot? Do they call Chinese food in China just food? Am I supposed to bow to say hello? How do they dance in China? Is it the year of the dragon? Do you know karate? Is everything made in China now? In Penn Station, you're not allowed to loiter, sleep on the floor, or panhandle. These violations should get you either kicked out, fined, or thrown in jail. You live here. Do you sleep here too? Yes. Do you have any addictions? What's your favorite drink? Uh, beer. Do you ever feel scared when you see homeless people here? What kind of drugs? How do you make money? Do you have rum in your pocket right there? Dearborn, Michigan is called the Arabic capital of North America. Almost 50% of the city is Muslim. The terrorists are giving you guys a bad rap. Do you wear a burqa ever? Do you want Sharia law here in America? Have you ever seen any suspicious activity here? Yeah. What do you do for a living? Middle East financial services. Financial services? Yeah, send money overseas or receive money. Well, that sounds suspicious. When people hear the word terrorist, they automatically think Muslims. There is a reason for that. Assalamu alaikum.